Ah. How's that for a fucking mic check? Oh. Oh. Is it the middle of August? Yeah, it sure is. So a question that might be rattling around your dome is like, why is she doing a July recap in the middle of August? Ordinarily, I'm on top of these things, but I had surgery, so everybody relax. But I'm back and better than ever, and I'm ready to talk about all the stuff that I watched in July. The structure that I follow is that I start with all the TV shows that I've watched during the month, then I talk about all of the non-horror movies that I've watched in the month, and this will include some new releases like Thor Love and Thunder. Then I'll be getting into everything that I re watched in the month of July, so this will also include a lot of horror movies. Then I'll be talking about all my new watches of old horror movies. So movies released before 2022 that I just haven't seen yet. And then finally I will talk about all of the new horror releases that I watched in the month. So let's kick things off with Moon Knight. I believe in my last recap I had watched like the first four episodes, so I finished the season. It was only three and a half out of five stars for me. Oscar Isaac's performances are hands down what carry the entire thing. And same goes for Ethan Hawke. He was an incredible addition as well. I think that it was worth it for the watch just for episode five alone. That episode really ties everything together in a very crazy, beautiful, and trippy way. Like, talk about a mind melt. It's definitely one of the weirdest things that Marvel has ever tried. But overall, I liked it. I didn't love it. For you, I can't say whether or not it's worth the watch. My biggest gripe with it is that in the past, all of Marvel's stuff, even when it's been in space with the Guardians, has still felt a lot more ground. This is really out there with all the gods and the fantasy vibes of it. It's just not necessarily for me. I don't love the direction Marvel is going, but alas. Up next, briefly, I tried again to watch Slasher. Listen, I started episode two of season one, so baby steps here. Last month, I did report that I had only watched the first episode, but the second episode starts with this extremely explicit and violent hate crime against this little gay boy, and I just had to turn it off. Like, it was just too much. I couldn't watch that. Maybe I should just try to start another season because I can't keep doing this to you in my monthly wrap-ups. I promise that if I try to keep going with the second episode and I only last a scene, I won't tell you guys. Up next would be Solar Opposites. I rewatched the entirety of this show because the third season did just release about a month ago. I love this show to death, but I fear that it is following in the same footsteps as Rick and Morty. It just feels like they're getting increasingly lazy about the concepts that they choose for each episode now. There are still a few episodes that definitely capture the magic of that first season, but they are very few and far between. There's one episode that's even all about trains, like they turn into trains. I can't even, I don't know what's going on there. I was checked out. Still a great show that I wish that more people would watch. I think that it's at the same level of entertainment as Rick and Morty, and in some ways it's even better. Up next, another new release would be Obi-Wan. This is the newest Star Wars show on Disney+, Plus, which is a throwback to the best trilogy of the Star Wars series. A joke! Stop! Stop! I'm joking. But kind of an overlooked trilogy just in terms of the story. They took Obi-Wan from being this random old dude in A New Hope that just gets swiped by Vader, and they expanded on his background so much. And then they only continued to do so with the show. And better than that, we got to spend time with a 10-year-old Princess Leia. This actress was fantastic. She was like the perfect little whip-smart badass that a young Leia would be. It was a beautifully made show, and James Earl Jones was still voicing Vader, which is amazing at his big age. This young man is 91 years old. Good for him. Hayden Christensen also makes an appearance as Anakin, and I thought that it worked really well. It doesn't feel shoehorned. Like, it actually makes sense visually with the story that they're trying to tell, because it's kind of like a non-linear type of moment. They did a fight scene with him that kind of mirrored the present day action, and they had other fun cameos too, but I won't ruin the surprise. Overall, I really appreciate the gaps that it filled in, and I thought that the action was fantastic. And the whole thing was directed by a Miss Deborah Chow. Good for you, Deb. But moving on to Boo Bitch, this is a slightly kind of horror release that's new on Netflix. This show is about two best friends, one of which having recently passed away, and she must figure out her unfinished business so she can ascend to a better place. This show is everything to me. It's the cornier, campier version of Mean Girls in every way. It rips off so much from Mean Girls, it's kind of bold for that, but it works so well in my opinion. But they thought I wouldn't catch it, huh? You thought I wouldn't sniff out every last copycat 
story beat. I'm like a drug dog, except for sniffing out movie references. But I don't care because the show took a really unique spin on this kind of typical Katie Heron type character. People even call her the wrong name. There's a mean girl. There's a dream boat boy. And I don't want to say what else they copy because no spoilers vibes. It also stars Zoe Coletti from Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. And her character is way better in this show. And she is so cute in this. Oh my God. One of my highest praises for this show is definitely the fashion. It's very modern in that regard. On another hand though, this feels like it was very clearly written by millennials or maybe Gen Xers who clearly have no idea how teenagers talk. <laughs> There's this one particularly bizarre running gag where the characters will speak in acronyms. Hey, uh, where the fuck has anyone ever seen that? LOL and LMAO were huge back in like 2012. And now they've just kind of ironically ended up as accents on the end of emotionally vague text messages. But if you can get past that, get past all the inaccurate, weird teenage politics, then you can just enjoy the dumb old archetypal characters. It's a very, very fun show and it's super easy to binge because every episode is less than 30 minutes and there's only eight episodes. I personally binged the entire thing in one night. <laughs> that does it for all the TV shows, so now moving on to all the non-horror movies that I watched. First up would be Thor Love and Thunder. I don't think we need synopses really for Marvel movies at this point. So let's just jump right in, okay? This movie was bad. I have to be honest though, I was busting up in this movie. Like it made me laugh a lot. Not in the beginning though, because the Guardians of the Galaxy have kind of an extended cameo and it's bizarre. They feel like AI generated robots that are standing in place of the actual actors. Everything about this movie was also just filler and I guess it was kind of a send off for Natalie Portman's character. But like who asked for that? She's never really fit in in the MCU. So it's weird to me that they would even bother to bring her back. But now I guess we have more of Thor's story filled in. Tessa Thompson is also great in these movies. I love her. Also her character is apparently gay, which had me excited in the theater. But the gay characters were just there for decoration. There was no substance there. One of them was only there to be played for laughs. And to be honest, it was funny, Your Honor. I laughed. A lot of people are saying that Christian Bale was the best part of this movie. And I think that's a fair thing to say. However, it feels like all the actors are in different movies, like the Thor actors and then Christian Bale and the Guardians, like they're all very much on different wavelengths. <laughs> Cause Christian Bale was playing the role so straight and serious and this movie was anything but that. On the Big Picture podcast, they were saying that it seems like he kind of wants to be the next Heath Ledger Joker because the Batman movies that he was in, they were only iconic because of the Joker. <laughs> I always neglect to even think of who plays Batman in those Heath Ledger movies. And I'm sure that the average non-DC fan would probably say the same. So they were theorizing that maybe he wanted to be the most iconic thing about this Thor movie, the way that Heath Ledger was in his Batman movie. Either way, Christian Bale was gonna be the best actor in that movie regardless. He just commits to the bit every time. After that, we have Where the Crawdads Sing. This is a new drama starring some really hot people about this woman who grew up as a swamp rat and she drew birds and fell in love and maybe committed a murder. That's my version of the synopsis anyway. I typically don't seek out dramas because they're usually just not for me. I know that some of the best movies ever made were dramas, but they usually just don't tickle my fancy. Unless they do. I ended up loving this movie. I cried, nay, I sobbed. And let's talk about why I cried. Let's not review the movie, right? Let's, let's talk about why I broke down. <laughs> to be fair, the first time that I cried, there was an essay scene and those always do me in. It's my worst fear and I kind of need a trigger warning because when they catch me off guard like they did in this movie, I, I can't handle it. I had a very traumatic response. Luckily, I usually book myself a seat in the corner that's like next to the handicap section. So I'm usually all by myself there because cooties, you know? So I had done that for this movie and then therefore there was nobody in my proximity to see or hear me sobbing. Lucky me. So be warned about that if you're the same as me anyways. The other time I cried was at the sappy romance shit and I'm not gonna elaborate because no spoilers. It was just so sweet and I related to it really hard. So I think that might be why I like the movie so much. I was seriously in my feels though. It literally had me texting my ex after the movie just to see how he was doing. Like I had it bad for this movie. A lot of people's complaints are that this movie is too slow and it's too long. I will agree that it's a two hour movie that feels like a three hour movie. And yet I was moved by pretty much everything that happened in some way. I never felt like my time was being wasted. I genuinely enjoyed getting to see the entire life of this character. And I think that that's where this movie played people because it was more of a slice of life kind of movie. Well, an entire life kind of movie, but it was advertised as more of like a crime drama thriller. 
thriller almost. So maybe that's something you should know beforehand to manage your expectations of it if you do want to watch this. But I loved it and I admitted I might have a soft spot for melodramas. I don't know. But after this, in the non-horror section, I'm not gonna lie to you, I watched a lot of Star Wars. As I mentioned, I was healing from surgery the past couple weeks and my dad was willing to just bum out with me on the couch and binge that whole franchise. In July, we only got through The Phantom Menace to A New Hope, so that's all I'm gonna talk about. And also, I won't go movie by movie in excruciating detail because I have a live stream planned to talk about the whole franchise, so I'm not gonna bore you now. But the original trilogy contains The Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones, and Revenge of the Sith. These are all the backstory of Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker as he becomes Darth Vader. And then it's also like the story of how Luke and Leia came into the world. The Phantom Menace is terrible, there's no two ways about it, and it's mainly because of the character of Jar Jar Binks, perhaps you have seen him in a meme. If you think I'm exaggerating, let's just listen to him say anything. Misa called Jar Jar Binks, this way, hurry! <laughs> There's really just no way around it. I, I have to admit, I wish that he fell into a giant cheese grater. But Attack of the Clones was great, super entertaining and weird, had a good time. Revenge of the Sith was marginally better than The Phantom Menace. As a whole, it's a bad trilogy, sure, but I do appreciate the story that it gave us. It just made me appreciate the subsequent shows and movies so much more, including Solo A Star Wars Story. This is basically the origin of how Han became Han Solo. Solo, how he met Chewie, etc, etc. This movie is hated on for absolutely no reason. I will not accept Solo slander. Especially because we got to see a pansexual Lando Calrissian played by a one Donald Glover. Star Wars fans are so ungrateful and they are dead wrong for letting this movie flop. To be fair, it didn't actually flop, but they spent $275 million making this movie and it returned less than $100 million more than that. The Disney overlords were not pleased. I just cannot with the Star Wars fans that don't let themselves enjoy anything. Like, it's called fan service for a reason. Let yourselves be served. But apparently, if it's not the original trilogy, it's trash. Ugh, go to hell. Go to hell. Up next was Rogue One, a Star Wars story. I am also surprised to report that Rogue One is one of the best Star Wars movies I've ever seen. When it came out, I went to see it in downtown Disney with my dad, so it's like this giant IMAX theater. So it should have been the best possible scenario to watch that movie, but I was only 16. I didn't really have any appreciation yet for like the grander scope of Star Wars. I hadn't seen the entire prequel trilogy or anything like that. I remember the first time I saw it, the whole time I was thinking, who cares about these characters? They are so boring. And it was all of this just to get the Death Star plans? Like that was the end goal? But now after having seen Obi-Wan, the other prequels, this means so much more to me now. Also at 23, I have a newfound obsession with Mads Mikkel that I did not have at 16, so that helped. This movie is gorgeous. The action is amazing. People are really not overhyping that third act. And the way that it so seamlessly ties into the very beginning of A New Hope, I was shook. So speaking of the original Star Wars from 1977, upon my rewatch, the opening of this movie had me kind of gagged because I was like, they just had no context when this first came out. And so my dad, who was watching it with me, this movie came out when he was, I think, a junior in high school. School. And he said, yeah, when this first came out, it was really confusing the whole time we're watching it, just trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Oh, and another thing too, after watching all the prequels and especially Rogue One, it definitely upped the stakes of those original movies because you know exactly who Darth Vader is, how he came to be, how evil he is. So that upped the tension for me, even though I've seen A New Hope so many times, but I finally kind of considered, I guess, the gravity of how important R2's mission was to get the Death Star plans to Leia. But that will do it for the Star Wars talk for now. I will complete that during my August wrap up. Well, and I'm going to talk a lot about it during the live. So if you're watching this from the future, you can just go to that Star Wars live stream. But now I say we move on to all the horror movies that I rewatched in the month of July. First up would be Suspiria from 1977. And I watched this to do my original verse remake comparison video. But I will say that I did enjoy it a lot more upon my second viewing. I think the first time I watched it was the summer of 2020. I watched it during the daytime for some reason. And I just, I didn't really get the charm. But this also 
also happened to me the very first time I ever watched Halloween, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, A Nightmare on Elm Street, because my younger brain just saw how dated these movies were, and I'm like, it's so dated. How is that scary to anybody? I still don't find it scary, but I appreciate it as an absolutely gorgeous film. Had a lot of fun doing that deep dive, so definitely check out that video too. Up next, I rewatched Escape Room Tournament of Champions, but this time I watched the extended cut, which I would actually prefer to call it the alternate cut. Surely you're familiar with the Escape Room movies. They kind of feel like a PG-13 rated version of Saw. A lot more puzzle-based and honestly a lot more fun. This might get me a little heated, but I'll try to restrain myself because my patrons have already heard me ramble about this at length. But basically, I call it the alternate cut because of how insanely different it is to the theatrical cut. The bulk of the middle of the movie is the same, but the opening and the ending and this one added character make it completely different. Because the alternate cut has the addition of Isabel Furman. Isabel fucking Furman. And no spoilers, but it's so much better, it's fucking absurd. I was down ridiculously bad after watching this alternate cut. Whatever executive made the decision to do reshoots and scrap Isabel Furman and go with a theatrical ending, whoever you are, you can catch these fucking hands. How could you be so stupid, bro? How? The implications of what it could mean for franchise potential if they had kept that original ending? How much better set up it would be to make a long-lasting and expansive franchise? How can I see this and they can't? How could they look at this amazing thing they created and think, oh, mm, better not? Was it just a ploy to sell more Blu-rays? I must know. As you can tell, it's driven me to the brink, so I better move on. We also rewatched The Woman in Black. Surely you at least know of The Woman in Black, and if not, if you've never seen it, I highly recommend it. The main things this movie has going for it are definitely the production design and the atmosphere. I'm obsessed with gothic aesthetics. It's one reason why Tim Burton has always been one of my favorite directors. And this movie has got it. It is so dark and bleak in this giant mansion that's like on its own little creepy island. Honestly, one of the most iconic horror movie locations ever. It's not a fantastic movie. You might not be too pleased by the amount of jump scares in it, but a lot of those jump scares did get to me because I think the tension is really well crafted. It has a great spooky atmosphere. Plus it's basically Daniel Radcliffe's debut because it was the first thing he did after being in the cradle of the wizarding world. And he was fantastic. He was actually my age or maybe a little bit younger when they shot this. So that's kind of upsetting. It just always hits me weird when people my age or younger are so successful. And then I remember like, oh yeah, <laughs> privilege. Nepotism is also an insane thing. Like so many more people in Hollywood are related than you would think. Like, you know, Riley Kyo from The Lodge and maybe a couple other movies. She's a fantastic actress. Uh, her grandpa was Elvis Presley. <laughs> I didn't know that until recently, but yeah, it's a lot of, it's a lot of people like that that are just so randomly related and you're like, what the fuck? But anyway, so aside from all those movies and the Star Wars, that'll do it for all my rewatches of the month. As for new watches of old horror movies, I'll kick it off with Suspiria from 2018. Again, watched it for that comparison video, but this movie is so weird and in a way that I surprisingly didn't like. And I saved this movie for the longest time because I thought that I was gonna love it. I wanted the conditions to be perfect, so I watched it on my parents' big TV. I waited till I was back home, you know, surround sound, good, good setting. I had also taken an edible so I could just like, you know, couch lock, zone in. I also had some of my leftover birthday cake and a drink, so really the conditions were perfect. So knowing that I had the perfect conditions and I still didn't like the movie, that really bummed me out. So sad to report on that one, but on to the next would be Hide and Seek from 2005. This horror thriller stars Dakota Fanning and Robert De Niro. When his wife takes her own life, he moves himself and his daughter out to the countryside where she makes a new imaginary friend named Charlie. This movie f***ed me up, babes. It sounds generic, but I promise you it's not. It has an edge of early 2000s cheesiness, it's true, but that cast, you can't deny that. Despite some of the weirder 2000s kind of aesthetic choices, like especially with the weird 2000s editing, you know what I'm talking about. This is still a very effective and skin crawling experience. Towards the end, I felt like things got a little bit predictable, but up until that third act, I had no idea what was gonna happen. And I would say that the third act kind of saves the movie, but even though the beginning was generic, I was still fully invested through the entire runtime. Maybe it was just the actors, but also we were watching this on a really old DVD, so it was in that three by four aspect ratio, and I know, I know. 
fuck this ratio. But sometimes that ratio has its place. This movie still had an amazing composition. Like it was still stunning to look at. I think part of it was this beautiful house that they shot in because it was very angular. So it provided a lot of depth. So I highly recommend it. It was one that flew under my radar for way too long. Next would be Reefer Madness, the movie musical. This film tells the life of Harper Affair in which young Jimmy Harper finds his life of promise turned into a life of debauchery and murder thanks to the new drug menace marijuana. <laughs> This is a very over-the-top campy musical that is not really a horror movie, but it kind of is in like the loosest of terms. It very much gives the same vibes as Little Shop of Horrors. There are just several things that I cannot believe about this movie. The fact that it came out in 2005, another 2005 movie, same year as Hide and Seek, that completely flew under my radar, and the fact that less than 5,000 people have logged this on Letterboxd. The fact that it stars Nev Campbell and she's doing this? I didn't even know she was a dancer and now here she is making me sweat. The fact that we also get to see Kristen Bell as a dominatrix, that's something. Also, the way that getting high is depicted in this movie, you would think that you were watching a movie about crack. Yeah, it wasn't very good, and I'm just not really into musicals in general, but ironically, the over-the-top dance numbers from this were probably my favorite thing. So I would say that if you're one of those theater kids or you just love musicals, then give it a whirl. My last new watch of old horror would be Mystery of the Wax Museum, from 1933. I don't know that I've ever actually watched a movie this old and I was blown away by the quality. Like I was quaking from how good this movie looked. I mean, look at it. And on Letterboxd, you probably saw me say, why does this movie have better lighting and composition than 95% of horror movies released this year? And I will live and die by that. Now I feel much more hopeful for my future endeavor whenever I decide to tackle the Universal Monster movies. Though I think that might have to be kind of a two-parter or maybe I'll make it like a mini three-part series. Cause there's a lot of those classic movies. So I might have one video that's devoted to like, you know, breaking down the history of them and then another devoted to ranking them. But that's all in the future. I have enough on my plate for now. But what really struck me is that the movie that I grew up on, the remake from 1953, changed hardly anything about this original film. Because I thought there were so many iconic moments from that first remake. And unbeknownst to me, a lot of those moments came from this original. And this one holds up, completely holds up. There's a really minuscule amount of annoying dated shit, surprisingly. Like there's this super irritating misogynistic dude that's always kind of talking down to this really badass woman that's kind of one of the leads of this movie. And then in the end, they end up together as like this enemies to lovers kind of moment. That was just kind of like a bleh ending to an otherwise really enjoyable movie. In all fairness though, I did kind of feel like it dragged a little bit, which is saying something because it's only an hour and 15 minutes long, which God bless. Remember when short movies existed? So I still prefer the 1953 and 2005 remakes, but this movie was a lot more fun than I anticipated. Now the moment all you have been waiting for. Let's move on to all the new releases that I watched in July. First up, I'm just gonna shout out Somnum. I know this is my own movie, how corny of me, but I'm not gonna review my own movie. I'm just gonna give you guys a reminder that you can find Somnum on Letterboxd. I would love for you to go watch it and rate it. I'll have it linked down below. So up next we have Unhuman. This one's disappointing because it easily could have been one of my favorite movies in comedy. Concept. Seven misfit students must band together against a growing gang of unhuman savages. Their trust in each other gets tested to the limit in a brutal, horrifying fight to survive as they take down the murderous zombie creatures. It's a great concept. It's a great idea. It's even a dark comedy, which I love. However, it was executed so poorly that it was verging on insufferable. Sometimes you can give movies a pass and maybe they'll be more of a guilty pleasure because it's like, oh, well, just one thing about it was bad. But I'd probably never rewatch this again for several reasons, the first of which being that the camera work fried my brain. It was constantly breaking the 180 line, which is one of the most basic foundational rules you learn in film school. So this movie was constantly breaking that rule. It was so disorienting and weird. And then that wasn't helped by the insanely gimmicky editing. The last thing that really just topped off my distaste for this movie was the terrible acting by several of the leads. Listen, I am rooting for this actress. I really am. But she was really bad and you know what she was really bad in the I know what you did last summer reboot show too because I think that she could easily be the next Sadie Sink next Jenna Ortega or like be right up there with those girlies if she just maybe like applied herself whilst working with her acting coach I want that for her and it's hard because this movie is supposed to be really funny and dumb and over the top in a bunch of ways but then they also try to ham in these really unearned moments of character growth and they just don't work and I think it's mostly because 
because of the acting. Because plenty of comedians can get you in your feels. I mean, Blockers, Booksmart, like those are two of my favorite comedies of all time. Super bad. It just did not work in Unhuman. And I have a couple other petty notes. Some of the ugliest opening credits I've ever seen. Like I could not begin to tell you what's going on here. They just love those gimmicky edits, don't they? And then the loser character is this guy. And I'm sorry, you're gonna act like this isn't one of the most gorgeous boys we've all seen. Uh, no. The next new release that I saw would be Nope. But of course, I already did a very long, full-length review of this movie, so you can go check that out. I also did a spoiler-filled live stream with my dad, so there is over two hours on this channel of Nope-related content. So for the last movie of today, let's discuss American Carnage. After a governor issues an executive order to arrest the children of undocumented immigrants, the newly detained youth are offered an opportunity to have their charges dropped by volunteering to provide care to the elderly. This also stars the Queen Jenna Ortega and is a dark comedy. I've described this movie to you guys as sort of a get out ripoff because that's definitely the vibe it's going for and you can definitely tell where it's inspired. But I think this movie is a ton of fun. It's not great. It has very obvious flaws, but beyond them, I think that the story is super unique. Truly never seen anything like it before. Like it's a wild ride. I think that no matter how annoying some of the characters are, honestly, all of them still manage to be pretty likable. And while it does make commentary on some pretty serious stuff, it still remains very lighthearted for the most part. There isn't too much dwelling on the stuff that's really difficult to watch. If nothing else, watch this movie for the story. I think it's so worth the third act. Just go in with the expectation that the uniqueness of the story is going to be the main thing going for it and don't expect greatness from all the other departments. And you know, we know it's always fun to see Jenna Ortega in a dark comedy. In this movie, she plays kind of a punk goth, so she's got that, you know, really stereotypical aesthetic and she wears dark makeup and she's so witty and she's kind of mean. It's so much fun that I don't even care how aggressive the stereotype is because I'm like, oh, me. So I do recommend it. Honestly, I think it was like six bucks to rent, but only if you really enjoy dumb, dark comedies, okay? That's an important stipulation. So on that positive note, that wraps up everything that I watched in July. Of course, not including the bajillion John Carpenter movies that I watched because I did do a wrap up, a deep dive of his whole career, which is why this video might not be nearly as dense as some of my other wrap-up videos, but I talk about all those at a pretty decent length in that video, so go check it out. So far, August is looking a little different because I was spending a lot of time recovering from surgery. So yeah, I have 20 Wes Craven movies that I need to watch, but I've also been watching just a ludicrous amount of other stuff too. I've really been doing my best to catch up on other 2022 releases, so there's gonna be a lot of those in there. And also to conclude things, a huge shout out to my patrons. If you'd like to become a member, the link is down below. If you'd like to get first reactions to movies like Bodies, 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 or They, Them, things like that. You can find that all on my Patreon. Or sometimes there are videos there where it's just like whatever I feel like rambling about. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody has those days. And again, make sure to go watch Somnum. That'll be linked down below so you can give me a rating on Letterboxd. I hope that you enjoyed this video and I hope I catch you in the next one. It's good to be back, baby. Bye!